Warning, the following episode is not cheery and bright. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by the new brand of greeting cards for people you can do without, Brawlmark cards. Brawlmark cards, because Aunt Kathy can go fuck herself and we're sick of pretending otherwise. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Hey, salut, c'est Pat à Montréal. Et puis, uh, en effet, on a évolué d'homme ou de femme singe dégueulasse. And for those of you who don't speak French-Canadian, well, it's true, we did indeed evolve from filthy monkey men or women. December 23rd. And it's Festivus. That's right. Well, some of us air our grievances every week, but for everybody else, there's Festivus. Some of us make a whole career out of it. I'm (laughs) No Illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And from Carl the Pug of Pegacorns, New Jersey. Hell yeah. Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Waycross, Georgia. This is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, our podcast gets a billionaire sugar daddy for Christmas. Oh yeah. A third grade teacher considers doing... Wintertime for Hitler, unironically, at a holiday concert. <laughs> and Tom and Cecil will be here to shit in a few stockings. But first, the diatribe. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry to do two diatribes about such a similar subject in a row like this, but I couldn't fit all my bitching into one segment. See, last week we talked about how silly it was for Christians to be pissed about the commercialization of Christmas, given that the commercialization is the only reason anybody gives a shit about Christmas. But this week I want to talk about how the commercialization is the only reason anybody gives a shit about Jesus. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's possible that Christianity could have perpetuated itself 20 centuries without a government sponsor. I mean, by the time the Roman Empire started warming up to it, it had already been around for at least a century and a half. And any religion that makes it that long has at least a chance of embedding itself long term. But even if it had managed to survive this long, there's no way in hell it would be the world's largest religion. It would be a weird oddity in the eastern Mediterranean that was noteworthy mostly for being way more into symbolic cannibalism than you like in a religion. Of course, that ain't our timeline. In our timeline, in the early 4th century, the Roman Empire realized that having a uniform religion would be swell, and of all the popular ones available at the time, Christianity had the strongest emphasis on docility. It taught the poor to be satisfied, it taught the victim to turn the other cheek, and it taught the parishioner to render unto Caesar whatever the fuck he asked for. Exactly the kind of religion you need if you want to grease the gears of commerce. Now, there there were some problematic elements. Right, Early Christians were a little too obsessed with not accumulating wealth, and their martyrdom fetish swelled to the point of an existential threat from time to time. But it was nothing that the ruling authority couldn't buff out after a few generations. So even if you buy into the origin story where Christianity started off as this well-intentioned effort to help the poor and see the humanity in everyone, you have to admit that for at least the last 1,700 years or so, it's been honed into a tool of oppression for the working class. It's a cultural tranquilizer that gives the masses something to think about other than how fucked up it is that their landlord gets to keep so much of their crop. And even if the religion actually started with the ministry of Jesus, and Jesus is the same peace Nick hippie that he's portrayed as today, it's been a tool of commerce for five and a half times as long as it was whatever the fuck they think it was back then. And it's not like Christians don't notice this shit. Hell, they accidentally boast of it. They'll point out how much comfort slaves found in the Bible or how popular it is for you know, the people in the poorest parts of the world. Of course, they think that's a symbol of how empowering their religion is to everybody. But in truth, it's the exact opposite. Christianity is popular among oppressed people because it was specifically crafted to appeal to oppressed people for centuries. And the effectiveness of that process exploded after the Reformation when decentralization ushered natural selection into the picture. The end result was, and inevitably was, a religion that excelled at subduing the masses to the yoke of commerce. Of course, it, it's pretty easy to find counterexamples to challenge that assertion, especially as the stock markets adjust to the latest variant that the anti-vax religious assholes have unleashed on the world. But that's just how natural selection works. 
this was never an entirely conscious process. So there are bound to be vestigial organs and junk DNA that outlived their usefulness or else never had any usefulness at all. I mean, all the religious ideas that sufficiently hinder the needs of the society die out, not all of them as quickly as the ones that actively kill their adherents. But one way or the other, they all die out. Anything shy of that, though, can linger on for centuries and plague the future with the bigotries of the past. But in the end, the purpose, whether intentional or not, is to sedate the masses. And so the result is to sedate the masses. Long story short, even if Jesus was the reason for the season, and he, he's not, but even if he was, that's no argument against commercialism, since commercialism is the reason for the Jesus in the first place. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the joyful and triumphant to my faithful Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick. Fellas, are you ready to come? <laughs> Okay, just give me a few more minutes, Noah. I'm 40 years old. I am 40 <laughs> years old. That's how it works. Just want a medium come one time. <laughs> no, it gets better, though. It gets better. I'm kidding. It doesn't. <laughs> In our lead story tonight, I have good news about the Supreme Court. I know I'm just as surprised as you are. But this week, the Supreme Court allowed the state of New York to maintain its COVID vaccine mandate for healthcare workers even though it doesn't allow religious exemptions, because even Brett Kavanaugh has to occasionally admit that magic isn't real if you're a nurse in a fucking emergency room. Jesus, it's it's bad enough that, like, Supreme Court doesn't overturn decades of precedent to grant dangerous new unconstitutional rights to Christians as news at all, yeah. let alone what passes for good news these days. That's good. Yeah, honestly, good news is anything short of Supreme Court owns every uterus now in the entire realm. Like the queen owns every swan. Like it's <laughs> yeah. not that. That's good Supreme Court news at this point. Yep. Yeah. Now, before we get too cheery, I want to point out that this was by no means a done deal. So Justices Gorsuch, Alito, and of course, Clarence Thomas all indicated that they wanted to hear the case. And Gorsuch wrote a lengthy dissent arguing that the exemptions mandate was motivated not by scientific evidence, but by hostility to, quote, unpopular religious beliefs, by which he means the even wronger than usual religious belief that the vaccine is made up of ground up fetal cells. I just, I, what, what a bad shit fucking argument from a Supreme Court justice, no less. It, if it wasn't for the unpopular religious beliefs, there would be no exemption to not have. <laughs> right? That's Just, actually the argument. The, the yes. fact that I can't even explain the stupidity of the argument without a triple negative should tell you how fucking nuts it is. Okay. Also, why is this hostility argument even a thing? If a public safety law is hostile to your belief system, that's an argument for our team. That's <laughs> yeah. what we say. Yes. You're in a public danger death cult of fucking terrorism. We're saying that. That's our point. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I just want to point out one of the like heart tugging cases Gorsuch hopes we are really going to feel for is an OBGYN he calls Dr. J about whom he says, quote, sometimes in emergencies, she has to rush into a delivery room without knowing whether a delivering mother is infected with the disease. End quote. But so what? So it's only fair the delivering mother should have to do the same. <laughs> exactly. What? Yeah. Follow up. Also, uh, just curious, how many fetuses are we killing in the name of Christian freedom? Are we doing a bunch? <laughs> before? It, what do the founding fathers yeah, think about that? I guess that's, right? that's the most important thing. Yeah. So bullet dodged and from the Handmaid's Tale cosplayers, no less. But hey, as a comfort to those religious folks out there, thanks to you creating Omicron, vaccines don't matter anyway. So it, it, you lost your jobs for nothing and you're going to die. You just won't get infected while delivering mothers and their babies while you do it. So, you know, it's up and down. There you go. And in great resignation news, I'm not a big fan of billionaires like as a concept. I mean, so consider this. Imagine that you were immortal and you could go back to the time that the great pyramids of Giza were being built and you earned a hundred pounds of gold every year. And then imagine that you took that gold and you put it in a bag and then you whacked billionaires in the fucking face with it for Gordon <laughs> money, Scrooge McDuck style while diabetics die rationing their insulin. Because seriously, fuck that shit. All that being said, 
if you're going to have billionaires, and apparently we are. We are, yes. Let's hope they can at least use some of their money and clout to tell the Mormon church how hard it can go fuck itself, which is what the richest man in Utah just did in his formal letter of resignation to the church. Oh, so he's uh, not a Mormon anymore. <clears throat> uh, Jeff, I don't know if you're listening, but if you are, did you know that our politics here at the Scathing Atheist match up identically with yours? It's true. It's true. Also, also, would the Mormon church let you pick a hole? Because we'll let you pick a <laughs> hole, Jeff. You know what, Jeff? I will not make you pick. I'm not going to make you pick. You do whatever you want. It is a buffet of holes. See, <laughs> all of the above. Indeed. I'm tired of saying it's a buffet of holes. All right. Yeah, I, I'm tired atheist. of you saying that too. Every episode. So in his letter, Green admonishes the church both for what they fail to do and what they do instead. He accused the church of, quote, actively and currently doing harm in the world, end quote, which I guess that's just an established fact. I'm not sure why I said accused, right? He just <laughs> could have gone with pointed out. Sure. He also pointed out the rank duplicity of the church in terms of its history, its finances, and its advocacy, adding, quote, I believe the Mormon church has hindered global progress in women's rights, civil rights and racial equality, and LGBTQ plus rights, end quote. Which, again, isn't really an I believe kind of thing so much as just an is kind of thing. But it's still a pretty damn big deal when as a prominent a voice in Utah is saying it and when the state's biggest newspaper is printing it. Yeah, nothing says you're out of touch like when a literal utility monster says you suck and he's right. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, you guys really suck. So I'm just going to go hunt an orphan in my hedge maze with a flamethrower. But then we're going to talk about your ethics. We're going to have, I might do a strongly worded letter. There you go. Perhaps. I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah. So now for those of you who are wondering if Green is putting his money where his mouth is, I should add that at the same time, he also pledged in his resignation to donate $600,000 or Zero point zero one two percent of his fortune to an LGBTQ advocacy group called Equality Utah. Oh, cool! That's almost as much as we raised in Bulgaria for charity as not billionaires. Good for yeah, you, buddy. No, That's exactly great. with a bunch of not billionaire listeners. Now, yeah. to be clear, Green is worth five billion dollars, and that's you know that's way more money than any one human should ever be able to acquire in the world. But it's still a pittance compared to the 12 figure fortune that the Mormon church controls and as unimpressed as I am with billionaire philanthropy between the two of them only one has pledged to spend 90% of their fortune on charitable causes while they're alive and it's not the one that gained its fortune by promising to spend it on charitable causes mm. so there's that yeah and next up in headlines Axios journalist Barack Ravid decided to get an early start on locking down the American Jewish vote for the blue team in the next presidential election. And with Donald Trump as the current frontrunner for the GOP nomination, it seemed like the best strategy would be having Donald Trump say things out loud into a recording device. Yep. So that's what happened. During a recent episode of his podcast called Unholy, Two Jews on the News, Ravid interviewed Trump about American foreign policy regarding Israel. And it went approximately slurward in <laughs> Trump's head. I'm sure he was talking about foreign policy, but in actual reality, it's just a long series of, you know, grammatically stilted Trumpian anti-Semitic jokes from the school bus when you were 10 in the form of an interview, sort of. Yeah, I I'm not saying it's ever fun to talk about Trump, but it's nice that he's just like a guy who used to be in charge when we talk about it now. Yeah, yeah, we should. Make sure to enjoy that while it lasts. TikTok. Yep. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So Ravid asked questions during the interview, obviously, but he didn't have to. It could have just been like, hello, Donald. Israel, Jewish people, you talk now. <laughs> See where this goes. <laughs> we would have got the same content either way. Sure. What a, for example, here's the first thing from Trump. As if he just walked on stage at a Nazi open mic and said, speaking of Jewish people, Trump started by saying, this is real. My father, Fred, was actually very close with the Jewish people because, of course, he worked in the real estate business in New York City. George. That's how he started. Uh, I happen to be a tremendous fan of gold. Just so you know. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Yeah. My dad had a lot of Jewish friends. Since, you know, they'd know how to take the curse off if it ever came to that. <laughs> those would have been probably better than what he actually did. And from there, Donald launched into a rant about how American Jewish people used to love Israel, but now the American Christians are actually 
better at being Jewish than the Jewish people. Hmm. Seriously, this that's what Donald said next. He goysplained to an Israeli journalist about how that works. According to Trump, quote, it's a very dangerous thing that's happening. People in this country that are Jewish no longer love Israel. The evangelical Christians of Israel more than the Jews. Jesus. End quote. Well, so partially thanks to Trump, evangelical Christians are way more into shooting people who get too close to the fence than Jewish people yeah, are. Yeah, so. yeah. Also, just quick reminder, evangelicals love Israel because when Israel is attacked, they get to get zooped up to heaven because the apocalypse is starting. Yes. So it's kind of like saying David Icke loves the moon the most because he knows that's where the reptilian base is hiding. <laughs> Very similar. <laughs> yep. So just in case you didn't quite have uh, anti-Semitic trope bingo yet, Trump decided he should also go explain to the New York Times about how to properly control the media with mm -hmm. Zionist mind control. So obviously you want to use plenty of 5G, but it's also about loving Israel in your newspaper. Trump closed it out by chastising the self-hating Jewish people in the Salzberger family who own the New York Times. Apparently, the Times hates Israel, too. Well, I mean, maybe it's the apartheid. I I'm just spitballing. It seems like you can be anti-apartheid as carried out by Israel without being anti-Semitic. I don't know. I just oh, I think that's my... That might be the explanation there. I don't know, Heath. I'm guessing your inbox is different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. Explain that to me with an email. Say about explain that. how that's I, what I said was wrong. Good luck. And in every Christ begins with K news. I hope you're ready for a hashtag throwback Thursday because the story from way back in 2019 is back in the news this week. So put on some Adele, nervously check CNN and rub your uncovered face on someone else's uncovered face to celebrate. Don't please don't do those things. Well, I, I mean, you can put on some Adele. Well, if, that's right? fine. There you go. All right. So the year was 2019. Keith had a full head of hair. Mm. I had a couple running jokes that don't hold up great in hindsight. Mm. And the online Christian jewelry store, Shields of Strength, had to be written a cease and desist letter by the U.S. Marines to stop making ugly ass fake dog tags with the official Marine symbol on them that talked about Jesus. Now, to be clear, that's because nobody's allowed to use official military logos for anything. Right. And Shields of Strength, the, the jewelry company, is actually a great example of why that is, right? If anybody is allowed to use official military logos, then it might be confusing when people see what looks like a dog tag that says, boy, we sure are Christian here in the Marines. And that was supposed to be that back in 2019. That is till this week when Shields of Strength showed their patriotism by suing the Department of Defense and the individual branches of the military for, you guessed it, religious persecution. Well, right? No, Gorsuch was super clear about this. The fact that they're not exempted from that law proves it's hostile to them. <laughs> what is happening? The crime they did proves the law is hostile to them. Again, <laughs> we are saying that. That's our argument. Why is Neil Gorsuch so confused? He seems very confused by the antagonistic relationship between laws and criminals. Why is that weird to him? Just slowly filling up a robber sack with stuff in his house. Are you mad? Because if you're mad, you're persecuting me. <laughs> yeah, so the lawsuit, which I gotta say reads like a shitty ex trying to get you back, explains that, oh, Shields of Strength had such a great relationship with the Marines when they were stealing their logo and they didn't know about it. And it wasn't until the mean old atheists like the Military Religious Freedom Foundation and the friendly atheist blog, yes, they literally blame Hammett Meta, really? that their awesome relationship was ruined, so now they're suing <laughs> those branches of the military. You didn't even care about my crime until you knew about it. Guys, <laughs> think about how close we came to getting Andrew a lawsuit for Christmas. Oh. Right? Like, imagine how much he would have loved to find that lawsuit in his stocking. <laughs> I know. Mm. I'm trying to get him lawsuits all the time, but he gets all nervous and mm -hmm. tums chewy. What are we going to do? We're going to put like a, a Cristiano brother toe in his stocking when we finally do it? Something Ooh, like that? Ooh, spoilers. Now, needless to say, this lawsuit is bullshit and without merit. But I also said that about Masterpiece Cake Shop. Um. So. Let's hope that this continues to be a throwback Thursday in that religion still has to follow some laws 
just like it did kind of sort of in the halcyon days of 2019. Woof. And just to make sure none of us add something like at least it couldn't get any worse, we're going to take a quick break and toss things over to my lovely wife, Lucinda. A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she was. If it's a legitimate race. It's it's a slut, right? Cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in Misogyny. Okay, so we all know that the whole a virgin birth thing was the result of a mistranslation, right? Like the Hebrew prophecy actually said young woman. The Greek translator read it as virgin. And to make Jesus match prophecy, they had to say his mom was a virgin. And I'm wondering if there's any mistranslation anywhere ever that has caused more suffering for more people. I mean, the cultural obsession with chastity obviously doesn't start there. The very fact that a pure Messiah could only come from a virginal vagina shows you that. But holy hell, encoding it in the top line of your religion like that has been a curse on women for a hundred generations and counting. Anyway, that's my way of saying season's greetings, and now it's on to some more topical misogyny. And we'll start off in Africa's most populous nation, Nigeria, where for the third time in five years, the national legislature has rejected a measure that would promote gender equality. And as fucked up as it was, I have to give them points for honesty. The senators voting down the bill actually cited as their reasons, quote, sociocultural and Islamic concerns, end quote. In other words, our society and religion are too backwards for that shit. And sorry to describe an African culture as backwards. I know it comes off as un-PC as fuck, but there's really no other way to describe Nigeria's record on gender equality. Like, America is bad enough with only about one-fourth of our legislature made up of women. In Nigeria, it's less than one-fourteenth. But among that super minority of female senators is one Biodun Ulajimi. And apologies if I get that pronunciation wrong, who has been working for years to pass this bill. And I should point out that it's not just about giving women equal rights. Nigeria has a terrible problem with gender based violence, and the bill seeks to redress that as well. And again, can't emphasize this enough. The justifications for opposing the bill and thus siding with gender based violence was almost entirely religious. A senator named Yusuf Yusuf summed it up perfectly for the AP. Quote, equating opportunities actually infringes on the provisions of the Quran and also the Bible, end quote. And while I'd submit Senator Yusuf got the conclusion as as backwards as he could get it, that statement isn't wrong. Anyway, given the tenacity of Nigeria's female senators, we're hoping this isn't the last we hear of this bill. Oh, and I guess since we've been gone for a few weeks, you guys are probably wondering if my arch nemesis, Lori Alexander, has turned over a new leaf and stopped being a willing spokesperson for the patriarchy. Well, it turns out, nope. Last I heard from her, she was in the middle of defending the family dynamics of the Duggars and bitching about lady preachers. Seriously, somebody wrote in to say something about how surely she can agree that Josh Duggar's wife should have divorced his ass, right? Well, Lori did not agree. Instead, she accused the concerned viewer of both feminism and humanism for shame. And then she pointed out that Josh Duggar only mildly molested his sisters. Her actual words. Then she followed that up a couple days later with a screed about how female preachers are heretics who, quote, were somehow abused in their lives, end quote. So, yeah, maybe she's waiting for the new year to turn over that new leaf. But I'll keep an eye out just in case. And on that note, I'll hand things back over to Noah, Heath, and Eli. Thank you, Lucinda. Next up in headlines in Oh Gun, All Ye Faithful News. Uh Uh-huh. Yep. Go ahead. It didn't rhyme. There's not a lot to this story, so if you wanted to (laughs) appreciate anything right now. Great pun, Eli. Thank you. All right. If one were to look over the legal landscape of America (laughs) in the year of our not Lord 2021, you might be convinced that we were a nation of extremely devout Bible believing Christians who until recently were kept in some kind of work camp with only a Charlie Brown S Christmas tree to comfort them. (laughs) The reality, of course, is that our nation is barely majority Christian in the most generous terms. And the definition of that word becomes ever more meaningless as exemplified by the River of Tri-Cities Church in Johnson City, Tennessee, who will be celebrating the birth of their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, 
by giving away two AR-15s, <laughs> one at the morning service and one at the evening one. Ooh, is it? No, it's it's not their fault. Everybody's just been spelling Prince of Peace wrong the whole time. It's just that's different. <laughs> Yes, Pastor Todd Holmes announced the giveaway on Twitter while wearing a shirt, I can't make this up, whose front is a bunch of weapons that spell out the word love. Oh, the, huh. the shirt might as well just say, Dear Noah, Heath, and Eli, don't forget to add jokes about me inserting these guns into my rectum for the purposes of sexual stimulation. <laughs> Jesus. P.S. These are lady guns. I'm not gay. These are <laughs> lady guns on my shirt. This is a weird shirt that I'm still reading, apparently. This shirt is done now. Meta shirt. <laughs> and look, I point this out because, well, because I wanted to do the gun all the faithful pun. But mm -hmm. it's important to keep in mind that these same people giving away guns to celebrate the birth of the Prince of Peace lose their fucking mind every time a cup is red. <laughs> <Yeah>. Right? <laughs> These people have waged a war on the sentence happy holidays since time immemorial. So next time your shitty uncle tells you there's a war on Christmas, maybe tell him to start at the churches giving away weapons of war. Yeah. <laughs> and in lock and load of shit news tonight. God, I love this story so Me, much. I was so happy with this. Evangelical pastor and Planned Parenthood's top involuntary donor, Greg Locke, took time <laughs> off from melting down Dunkin' Donut sugar crystals in a spoon this week to declare a Mexican <laughs> statue as a harbinger of the end times. The chimerical statue is on display outside the U.N. building in New York City, and Greg Locke couldn't help but notice that it looked an awful lot like the legendary beast of Revelation. <laughs> well, except for the two horns of a lamb and the feet of a bear. Sure. I, I, but it also only has one head. Okay. Um, okay. And it's the head of a jaguar instead of a it's a lion. Kind of losing it. Also, it has eagle wings, which aren't mentioned in Revelation. Only That's Daniel. Even, no. But other than every <laughs> single detail mentioned in the Bible, it looks exactly like the beast from the earth. Nailed it. Yeah, Greg. Do you think he workshopped that at home first? He was like, uh, "Can't help but notice those leopards in front of the New York Public Library." Now, you know what? I'm going to go with the UN one. That's, <laughs> that's stretching too far. Hey, Greg, there was a literal wave of scorpions last month. Right? <laughs> you want a harbinger of the apocalypse? Maybe the time when a city got attacked by a wave of fat-tailed scorpions whose Greek name means man-killer after God created a giant storm. How are you not using You're so bad at your evil job. <laughs> That's so easy. So, the statue in question is a type of Mexican art called an alabrije which is a colorful chimerical creature that dates back to the 1930s. Super popular in Mexico. And for good reason. They're, they're fucking awesome. They have a big ass parade in Mexico City filled with them. And this one was apparently presented as a symbol of Mexico as a guardian of world peace, which is a tad overblown. Sure. But it's a long ways from demonic. But that's not how Greg Locke saw it. Greg, Greg, give me a call. I have a way of pronouncing that statue that will tear a podcast audience apart, buddy. Look me up. <laughs> wow. It's a pretty deep cut there. That's so deep. When you recorded that, your mic was still pointed at your desk right? instead of your yeah. face. It was. And then you gave me a third of your company. It was a really so. weird decision on our part. Now, <laughs> cool. granted, the way that Greg Locke first saw this statue was almost certainly underneath a headline on CBN's website that said, quote, UN sculpture looks a lot like the end times beast referred to in Daniel 7 and Revelation 13, end quote, which is fucking wrong. It looks like <laughs> neither of those things at all. And neither of those things look like one another either, by the way. The only common threads are chimera and feline. But if Greg Locke let facts get in the way of his sermons, he couldn't exactly have sermons, now could he? So during a sermon he did last Sunday, he paranoia to quote, did you see that statue they put in the U.N. in New York? That is predictably prophetic. <laughs> okay, man. It's, all prophecies are predictable, Greg. That's the whole <laughs> thing with those words. Yeah. Or, or do you think the U.N. has like a high batting average of predicting the future with statues? <laughs> Ooh, is that what you were saying? He might. He goes on. It's right there now. Face of a leopard, wings of an eagle, paws of a bear. It's there right at the UN. Again, to be clear, he just described both the Beast of Revelation and the statue wrong. Revelation says face of a lion. The statue doesn't have a paws of a bear. He continues, quote, read your book. <laughs> God damn it. 
quote, I'm about to buy me some plane tickets to New York because I'm going yes. to the statue and I'm going to get me a live Facebook video. Yes. You got the wrong one saying I won't. I'm going to do it. God done told me I'm going to do it. I'm going to go to New York City, USA. Wow. That, okay. We murder everyone who says I'm going to go to New York City, USA right before they come to New York City, USA. You get murdered in New York City when you say that. Like, I'm not trying to be predictably prophetic. But, <laughs> yes, I am. Yeah. That's yeah. what happens. Yeah. He concludes, quote, I don't care what that masked up demon possessed governor has to say about it. I'm going to climb up on that leopard head and I'm going to preach this nation that if we don't turn and we don't repent, God is about to level the whole thing, ladies and gentlemen. End quote. Please come to the COVID epicenter of the United States. Please. <laughs> so, there you have it. Uh, look for a video coming soon of Greg Locke yeehawing his way through a sermon atop a Mexican leopard statue, regardless of what the voices in his head might have to say to the contrary. <laughs> Further bulletins as events warrant. Okay, okay, but guys, guys, not just Omicron, but that also means that I could feasibly costume up and hang out with Greg Locke. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying it's been a while since I've tasted Christian eyeball and I got the hunger. Oh, so what you need to do is dress up like a leopard with eagle wings and the bears or the paws of a bear. <laughs> I bet That'd be no, the f do it. <laughs> Seriously, I will do that. I will show up. If he announces a date, oh. please tweet that at me. Me and Anna will make a costume and I'll show up and just look hurt in the background oh, of his sermon. Yeah, Rachel could help with that. She could probably do that. Absolutely. We'll get the whole team. Yeah. This is a red alert. <laughs> <laughs> and finally tonight, in Who Started All the Wars on Christmas News? Jesus, this story. It turns out there might be some anti-Semitism still going around in the United States. Uh, even after Donald Trump explained to all the American Jewish people how they can be way cooler and avoid all that bigotry, Still happening, apparently. And uh, last week, we got possibly the most shocking version of anti-Semitic insanity I can imagine. Like, okay, seriously, try to think of the craziest possible example. You're not even close. You're not even close. Here's what actually happened. An instructor at a public elementary school in Washington, D.C. had a third grade class do a reenactment of the Holocaust to learn about the true meaning of Christmas. Every single word of that sentence is as impossible to predict as the last. <laughs> right? right? Yeah. Now, but to be fair, the most shocking version of anti-Semitism that I imagined was the thing those third graders were reenacting. So I like, I feel like I won. I, I don't <laughs> yeah, know if one is the right it's, word, but uh, we all and, win. That's tricky. Yeah. So, I can't stress this enough. This is all real. This really happened in the year of our Lord, 2021, a class of third graders, that is eight year olds. Usually it was led through a LARPing campaign about the Holocaust. They were told to act out firing squads and the digging of mass graves. Some of the students were cast as victims of gas chambers, and they were told to act out that type of death with physical space work this all happened i'm a bacon i'm a bacon okay i mean these are third graders so you know one of them was like no no i have super lungs so i blow away all the gas and you're <laughs> dead now i'm just trying to picture I like i i feel like holocaust reenactments shouldn't have giggling or people saying no giggling right both yep. of those things we've gone wrong either way yep that should be a rule okay so you're probably wondering if an eight-year-old child was specifically cast as Adolf Hitler for the reenactment, yes, yes, that happened. Oh, Was that student a Jewish person? Yes, he was. Oh, Jesus yes, he was. Christ. Did the school's principal have to write the craziest mass apology letter of their <laughs> career? Yeah. Also, yes. Yeah. And most importantly, you're probably wondering about the true meaning of Christmas and how that lesson came through in the reenactment. So were the kids. They were wondering the same thing. At the end of the class, the kids wanted to know why the Nazis would do all those terrible things. And the instructor said, quote, real quote, this is real. If this is so unbelievable that I messaged Heath last night before I recorded. And I was like, hey, Heath, is that a real quote or is that a joke that you don't clarify? And I <laughs> almost followed up by saying it can't possibly be a real <laughs> quote. Nope. 
This is what really happened. The kids asked, why would Nazis do all those terrible things? The instructor replied, quote, because the Jews ruined Christmas. <gasps> and then the instructor added, don't tell anybody about our fun little class today, right? Just <laughs> yes, between us. Right. This uh, reenactment of genocide will be our little secret. <laughs> yep. Okay, so there's lots of debate these days about what type of curriculum is appropriate for public schools. That's a big thing. One side is worried about critical race theory because America has become way too politically correct and woke and oversensitive about bigotry. The other side is worried about Christian neo-Nazis reenacting the literal Holocaust with eight-year-olds in order to teach the very important message that the Jews ruined Christmas. Yep. So, yeah, both sides and all that. It's, it's tricky to parse it all out. Um, just keep in mind that the one side, if, you, if you're having trouble parsing out the sides, the one side has a teacher saying the Holocaust was a reasonable pushback against the war on Christmas. That's what one side has on their team. Jesus. And, and while we all reflect on the fact that Nazi reenactment was literally taught to more elementary school kids this year than critical race theory, we're going to close the headlines for the night. Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Jumanji. And when we come back, Cecil will join us for some lighthearted insults, and Tom will explore the darkest parts of our inner selves with painfully honest descriptions of the human condition. It's this thing. That's this <laughs> thing. It's that time of year again, the time we fill with joy, goodwill, and verbal eviscerations of our enemies. That's right. We've still got a few more vulgarity for cherry roast to knock out, which means it's time to bring back the posh and ginger to our scary baby and sporty <laughs> Tom and Cecil of the Cognitive Dissonance Podcast. Gents, welcome back. I would argue none of us qualify as sporty. I just want to say that. <laughs> just out loud. I just, can I call posh? I'm, well, I have no soul, so I'm ginger too. All right. Those are, that's accurate. That's accurate. <laughs> Souls aren't real anyway. You're good. No, there's, uh, it, it, look, scary baby and sporty. It's so obvious which is which on our team of those. <laughs> right. Guys, that we're just, Keith is absolutely going to be sporty. That's fine. It's the reach. Before we get going. <laughs> I, 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 I play, sp I don't, it's not all tall. It's I do reach. It's reach to, advantage. That's reach what it is. Reach He's advantage. a good goalie. Yeah, that's no, yeah. fine. That's reach, reach but yeah. All right. Yeah. So <laughs> Probably the best basketball player here. I was on the reach. college volleyball. Also okay, reach. I hear it. Volleyball. Hear volleyball. Tall. Also tall. Tall. People. Tallness. I've done. Yeah. I don't know if you. Right. Yeah. I was a jockey for a minute. <laughs> 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 on a miniature horse. It's very small. <laughs> See, well, damn it. Now, so I had this whole before we get going thing, but we were already roasting Heath, obviously. Yeah. So it's going to be after we get going. But Positive. But before we get any more roasts in, we need to thank the people who contributed to the fundraiser without asking us to do additional work, starting with Dylan W., Sarah B., Kelly D., Kate A., Hannah and Zach, and Anne. And thanks plus a free small ramekin of free thanks to Sarah D., Daniel C., Michael A., Danny, Michael W., Mike S., and Sally F., and a whole rotisserie chicken of thanks to Faith, Sarah M, <laughs> Jennifer, Jalen, Gail and Christopher, Teresa, Jim B, and an atheist in a foxhole. And of course, we had a couple of folks from the award winning Are You Sure category, Tony and Jim M, who both gave us a thousand bucks for nothing. Are you are you sure? Are you sure <laughs> you want to do that? <laughs> and our most are you sure donation, Elvis. Ooh, ooh. Elvis is a guy who's written stuff for our show before, music for our show before, Elvis and Sharon, who kicked in a whopping 2215 bucks. Holy shit. Wow. For nothing. Ooh, for nothing. Indeed. Uh, Eli, we're going to start with you. Marjorie would like a roast of Midwest Nice. Excellent pick. Oh, hey, Midwest. I'm sorry. Is the fact that you appear to have duct taped a smile to your dead, lifeless eyes nice to you? <laughs> I didn't realize that the fucking Stepford Wise was more of an aspirational goal for you flyover states. <laughs> I mean, look, sure, in Marjorie and my home state of New Jersey, we'll tell you to fuck yourself, but we'll do it with our mouths and for the length of a sentence, not with our cold, lifeless expressions for the rest of our mutual lives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're not... <laughs> 
Midwesterners, I'm from there. We're not fooling anybody anymore, okay? <laughs> Tom is from there. Is Michigan doing that, too? Am I in that now? You are in that. that oh, people oh, are sure, yeah. smiling? Deeply in that. Yep. God damn it. All right, so Heath. Uh, Fuck you. Thank you. Good. <laughs> oh, there you go. All right. Now that you're all warmed up, Nikki would like a roast of potatoes. Okay. And I can't think of a better man for the job. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's racist, but that's fine. So <laughs> um, Nikki's email ranked us, the five of us, in order of physical attractiveness. Ooh! Yep. What? Uh, so wow. Noah won, and the rest of us lost. Super Wait. fun. There's a fun start to that I want to know the order. I demand the order. <laughs> Eli, you know the order. Come on, man. <laughs> yeah, if I, if I the won, order. then we do not know the order, okay? <laughs> Noah first, the rest of us lost. It's fine. So, uh, <laughs> also in that email, we are told that the genius, very extremely amazing inspired idea for roasting the potato was from Nikki's husband and we were told that her husband does not enjoy puns and uh you know I totally agree Nikki's husband I am not a fan <laughs> of puns either. Uh, 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 I tuber now Tom wordplay <laughs> I burn out on wordplay he, he did it you can't just build uh, you can't just build an entire bit around pums and puns and word play. Would I? Would I? Would I just oh. keep doing that? Yes. For this whole time, no keep in mind just how important you are to me for who you are. You're important oh. to me. Keep that in mind. It, it's grotten to the point where <laughs> trust it gets to a better joke and I'm not just spending this whole time giving you the fingerling. So, <laughs> just just believe that I'll get to that next week. I am standing and applauding right now. Bravo. Well, maybe you well, should well have done. reconsidered your order of attractiveness. I don't <laughs> want to go next now. Uh, <laughs> this is Swaz. Fuck you. Uh, all right. I got one for you here, Noah. Nathaniel would like a roast of the Alaskan congressional delegation. Oh, just tee me right up. Why don't you? Yeah, that's going to be a uh, Lisa. No, I have a real conscience. You just don't know it. It lives in Canada. Murkowski, <laughs> the senator, uh, smart enough to know better, but dumb enough to let us know that she still knows better. <laughs> of course, there's also Dan. I'm smiling with my human face lip Sullivan, whose past accomplishments included leadership positions in the National Economic Council and the National Security Council in the administration of one George W. Bush. Famous for his stellar handling of economics and national security. <laughs> and of course, Alaska's sole House member, 25 term Congressman Don Young. A term? Yeah. Not year? Term. Yes, term. Yes. Mm. What the fuck? Yeah. Yikes. We definitely don't need limits on that. We don't need <laughs> no, limits. No, no. Uh, it's called it's elections, Tom. It's called <laughs> elections. You guys are ridiculous. <laughs> no, so he's an ex never Trumper. It's an uh, interesting position uh, to be in. Never. <laughs> never works. Never works different than that. He also, he once blamed Alaska's national disgrace of a suicide rate on government handouts. What? Because you know how, you know how having the ability to make ends meet is so highly correlated with suicide? It's like <laughs> that. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, that's math. Also, Daniel, he looks like if Santa decided to start an MLM instead of doing the toy thing. <laughs> oh, he does. <laughs> All right. Uh, I got one right back for you, Cecil. Sarah would like a roast of the people who are responsible for Glenn Youngkin's election. So, Sarah, you ever watch a sporting event and it looks like the refs really want one team to win over the other? That's America. <laughs> the refs all across the country have been penalizing one side. Illegal voting, perfectly yeah. legal voting. Illegal voting. 15 <laughs> yards. We closed down all these polling centers in black neighborhoves. Roughing the ballot box. No more vote by mail. You have a 15 minute vote window on Tuesday afternoon. Right. Sorry, 15 minutes. So it's easy to look around and think that the deck is stacked against you. And then in your state, the halftime show was the Fox News marching band featuring the critical race theory dancers, <laughs> and the promotional giveaway was racist dog whistles. <laughs> sure was. Uh, yes. Add all that up. <laughs> all right. And Tom, Dan gave you a bit of a choice here. He would like a roast of Joseph Merkla, Jenny McCarthy, or Robert Kennedy Jr. Your choice. Oh, all right. You know, it, it was hard to pick between these three at first, and then I... I thought about it. I realized I absolutely had to pick Jenny McCarthy. 
Clearly, all three of these assholes have time and again poisoned the well of the most valuable category of disease avoidance we have ever created. But Jenny McCarthy used the mom card to subvert and undermine the credibility of vaccination. And that's what makes everything she has done so much worse. Moms get an enormous amount of responsibility and even more shit, that's to be sure. But they also have an immense amount of social capital. Moms are the ones we trust instinctually not to go out for a pack of smokes, never to return. So when they look right at the camera and tug at our heartstrings with fiercely protective stories of their journey to protect their children, we are primed to believe them. But even though we are primed to believe it, it doesn't make it true. And Jenny McCarthy has made an entire cottage industry out of leveraging the social power of motherhood to convince other moms to play viral Russian roulette with their kids. If there's anything more crass and cynical than using your own children to harm and kill other kids, kids who almost certainly have less opportunity and privilege and resources than your own, I cannot imagine what that could possibly be. Jenny McCarthy should have faded from the public spotlight like every other smiling, irrelevant pair of tits the world has gotten tired of looking at. <laughs> the best thing we can hope for is a road to Damascus-style conversion that takes place right after one of her precious little vectors gasps their last so that Jenny can hold the still, breathless, and cold result of her own actions in her trembling arms as she slowly and permanently comes to the perfect realization that she is absolutely responsible for the silence that fills her home and that that silence is only ever drowned out by the unending screams of her own broken heart. Good Lord. Oh. God. <laughs> okay, but fuck Robert Kennedy Jr. too. All right, yeah, 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 yeah. Merkel to be it's fair, it's yeah, Merkel too. Yeah, they're all they're all pretty bad guys. All right, so this next one is a two for uh, both Mark and Paul. Would like you to roast Congressman Jim Hat 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 Gorn Hat Hat Gorn. I don't know. I don't even know who the fuck this is. But Cecil Heath, why don't you guys take this one? I don't know, but I'm going to pronounce his name wrong a few times too. Whatever it is, <laughs> sure, for yeah. sure, Jim. Looks like someone hastily made a sculpture of Michael Caine out of unused pig parts. He, <laughs> really he looks like a seat cushion at Ed Gein's house, man. <laughs> he looks like the kind of guy that could get chased out of his workplace by violent revolutionaries and then vote to decertify the presidential vote. Uh, yes. <laughs> because that's what he fucking did, man. Uh, that happened. Jim Hades corn. Yeah, he looks like <laughs> he looks like Don Rickles roasted himself for decades, and that actually changed his physical appearance for for the negative. To be clear, he looks worse than what you think of when you think of Don Rickles. <laughs> like, like Don Rickles did the picture of Dorian Gray thing, but you know when he sold his soul to the devil. He used Jim Hades corn instead of a painting, and and Satan was like, "Oh, you're gonna use a Republican congressman? Nice, yeah, that's great, that's great, that's better than me. I'm gonna start offering that from now on. Actually, as like part of my menu. That's, that's awesome. Well done, sir. I have another two for here. This is an interesting one. Michael C would like a signature Tom roast for and an Eli impersonation, both of Jesse Lee Peterson. All right. Yeah, this is going to be fun. So, Tom, I'd like you to roast JLP and Eli. I'd like you to receive said roast as JLP. Oh, all right. OK. Jesse Lee Peterson. Hello. Absolutely has got to wake up just completely exhausted, keeping up the insane charade that is everything about himself. I've never seen that musical. Now, here is a guy who appears That's to be happening. single mindedly obsessed <laughs> with very waspy toxic notions of masculinity while in no way having access to any of the advantages enforcement of those stereotypes confer. Right. I understood like four of those words. <laughs> this is a guy what? who looks like he's made entirely out of a pile of defrosted chicken livers <laughs> hastily <laughs> stuffed into a rag dot. <laughs> And this mopey, droopy sack of shit is going to lecture us with his half-formed, dim-witted blandishments on the virtues of male toughness? I have a medical condition. <laughs> if anyone has ever protested too much, it is Jesse Lee Peterson, a man whose 
constant haranguing and harassment of the black community is such a self-evident pandering to the whole white wing power establishment. He may as well be asking for permission to do his work in the house rather than outside. Please and thank you. I don't understand that reference. (laughs) (laughs) Does he have a list? Yeah. That was simultaneously ableist and racist. It really (laughs) was. Yeah. Thank you. One of the worst things that I've ever let get through the edit. So nailed him. Got him. Roasted him. All right, so Amanda would like a roast of Eli in the form of whoever has the craziest story about him that would be legal to tell on the air. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. I have one that's. it seems like it's not going to be, but it is. I think it's legal. So for Vulgarity for Charity, actually, three years ago, we got an email. Somebody wanted a roast of their wife. I think a husband and a wife wrote to us being like, "Uh, we want, we've decided to have This person roasted and they sent pictures of the wife who wanted to be self. She wanted herself roasted, but they were like boudoir style pictures. What? Yeah. Yeah. So not like all the way porn, but like, (laughs) but like boudoir style. I know the story. And the email didn't specifically enough, in our opinion, say like, also, just so you know, both of us have decided this is exactly what we want. This has been consented to by both people, especially obviously the person who these pictures are of. But so Absent that very explicit thing that we would have loved to see in the email, (laughs) Eli was like, all right, you know what? We're going to we're going to have to obviously email this person back, these people back. I'm going to check with Andrew how to word that email just to be like super, super thorough about it. (laughs) So he he calls up Andrew and he explains what's happening. And Andrew's like, oh, good. You know what? It's it's great that you contacted me about this. I'm sure it's going to be fine. But like, yes, you should make sure, you, you know, both people very specifically say yes. I'm choosing this. And uh, <laughs> so Eli lets him go through this whole explanation. Like, Eli, what, like a couple minutes of like yeah, legal bullshit, sure. right? Mm-hmm. So a couple minutes of like covering all the legal bases. And then finally Eli's like, oh, Andrew, which is one of the things, I feel like I should have said this at the beginning. Um, this person is 12 years old, to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> at which point Andrew's like, <laughs> You start uh, snorting tongues. This is yeah, it's different just... than I have to check. Oh, I got to call back. <laughs> Hold on. I, Harvard is going to be, I don't know what I do right now. And so then fi- Eli lets him do all that for like sputtering for another two minutes. And he's like, nah, man, I'm just fucking with you. I'm just fucking with you. And I think if I remember correctly, the best part of this was that Andrew had one of the watches that like kept your heart rate. <laughs> Did it call 911 for us on the phone hearing the thing going off being like you are having a heart attack literally right now you have to deal with it that's amazing <sighs> so the uh, but moral of the story not that was a joke he made that up yes that was not exactly it's an no, adult and yes it was it turns out we Adults. learned 100 percent consensual yes who sent boudoir pictures of this is the best script they sent boudoir pictures of him this year <laughs> <laughs> oh really <laughs> they're like hey yo sorry we scared andrew nice here's my husband's wang <laughs> <laughs> all right i feel like amanda got her, got her money's worth on that one i got another special request for you eli a seattle exmo would like you to roast brigham young as brigham young in your donald trump impersonation what Ooh, all what? right i think this calls for a doodly do in doodly d it does orson orson get in here uh yes yes mr young There he is, the big man, good old Orson Pratt, my loyal friend and servant who will never betray me and die for it. How's that wife of yours? She hates your fucking guts. Classic, always joking that one, lover. Anyway, I don't know if you heard about that Martin Willick handcart company, but we got to help those guys out. Uh, Because they're fellow Mormons? Oh, no, because they have my shit. Uh, There's a still in there. Plus, they got some of my child brides. So get on that. Chop, chop. Oh, Oh, speaking of Chop Chop, how's the genocide going? <laughs> I mean, good. I, I mean, it's bad because it's genocide. But like, I mean, it's it the it's going according to plan. That's what I love to I hear. I love to hear it. And hey, hey, make sure you send the U.S. the bill for that, okay? I'm sure you want me to send a bill to the United States for a genocide that you committed, even though we're actively at war with the U.S. government right now. War with the yep. I'm going to try to kill you. Well, what? I, I said, I'll see what I can do. That's my boy. <laughs> Orson. <laughs> Love you. 
All right. Noah and Cecil, you guys are up next. We need you to team up for this one. Zachary wants a roast of his cat, Lynx. Oh, my God. He said the saddest Stockholm Syndrome email about <laughs> he this did. cat. He did. He's talking about how the, oh, the cat cries until I pick her up and it won't let me use my keyboard or my video game controller. It makes me put the lotion in the basket, whatever it is. <laughs> but, and, and then he adds it that he's like, but but I wouldn't have it any other way. But why not, Zachary? <laughs> why wouldn't you just wait? I mean, I'm not saying you can't have a healthy relationship with this cat. I'm saying you don't. You don't have- <laughs> Dude, stand up for yourself. Zachary, I'm sorry. If your cat eats an entire loaf of bread and then throws up, you have the Eli Bosnick of cats. <laughs> <laughs> it's fair. Your cat screams, thrives on attention, demands you watch it eat, and constantly wants to be held like a baby. Ibid. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. That's all I'm saying. All right, and to close off our round of special requests, Tom, Ray gave us 5000 freaking dollars oh, wow. a price for which Eli That's would... A lot have apparently murdered two and one third people <laughs> <laughs> for a roast of his coworker, Jeff. He hates Jeff. Oh, man. Wow. God. They, Jeff is the same fucking cookie cutter set of community college ideas about the world that got old as soon as you heard them and had to say them back to someone else out loud. <laughs> like he is the kind of guy who claims to be a fiscal conservative, but who, and I absolutely guarantee that this is the case, cannot possibly give a three sentence description of exactly what that means. He cannot describe what the national debt is or how basic monetary policy operates. What he means by he is fiscally conservative is what everyone who says this means that he doesn't like paying his taxes. Hey there, fucko. Here's something that might shock you. Literally nobody likes to pay taxes. The difference, though, is that some of us understand that by paying taxes, I enrich the society that I literally count on every day for every part of my fucking existence, and that in turn enriches me back. Some of us understand that while we might not need help now, we may need help later, or that we needed help in the past, or that somebody we've loved may need help, and that having a robust social safety net helps people get back on their feet more quickly and with less social and financial costs than letting them just suffer. (laughs) There's actually no such thing as being fiscally conservative. Ask anyone who says they believe this nonsense to explain what they mean, and all of them will fail in minutes because this is not a meaningful thing to fucking say. And every single one of these fucking liars is more than happy to take their Social Security and their Medicare when it's their turn or to cash in some VA benefits or (laughs) apply for disability if they're the ones that get hurt, right? What guys like Jeff mean is that they are the exception. But there's nothing exceptional about Jeff. (laughs) And there never has been. Jeff is so run-of-the-mill you could put him in a lineup with only himself in the room and he still wouldn't get picked. (laughs) He is the same as the same as the same. And every time you meet Jeff, you have met a thousand fucking Jeffs. He wears his sunglasses on his hat. I guarantee it. That's something that he is about. He is about that. Off the top of my fucking head, I could give this guy's speech at a wedding or eulogize him at his funeral and make a fucking grocery list in my head while I do it. (laughs) You know those sunglasses are going upside down on the hat. Absolutely. For no reason. They don't even fit better that way. It's dumb. Truly the most exceptional thing about the dude is that somebody gave Tom $5,000 to roast him. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. This is the best thing he'll ever do. Yep. It's uh, the only time he's ever been worth $5,000. Right, yeah, no yeah. shit. And this is Noah cutting in mid-segment to apologize. We couldn't fit all the remaining roasts into one episode, so we had to split this segment up. But Tom and Cecil will be back to wrap up Bulgaria for Charity 2021, and there will even be an Anna song. But for all of that, you have to wait until next week. Before we settle in for a long winter's nap tonight, I want to wish all of you a happy holidays and a very merry plain red cup. But seriously, be safe and push your Republican relatives away with a poll. Even if they say they're vaccinated, don't trust those motherfuckers. They say all kind of shit. Anyway, that's all the blast we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show's hot friend, God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday, and an even newer episode of our half-sister show citation needed debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I can't put the bow on this thing until I thank Heath Enright for being merry, Eli Bosnick for being jolly, and Lucinda Lucian for being bright. We need to thank Tom and Cecil for all the work they put in and are still putting in to make Bulgarity for Charity so successful this year. Also want to thank Pat in Montreal for providing this week's Farnsworth quote, but most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's heaviest helpers. 
Henry, Jared, Mitch, Taryn, Renee, Dan, Arthur, Kiavar, Melissa, Slightly Sarcastic Teacher, Royce, Daniel, Other, Daniel, NC, Infidel, Pierced, Freak, Jasper, Veronica, and Z, who are so naughty it's nice. Together, these 18 lean, mean, blaspheming machines inched us ever closer to our crazy billionaire dreams by giving us money. Not everybody has the money it takes to give us money, but if you do, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash scathingatheist, by you'll earn access to an extended ad-free version of every episode, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but you got enough shit to worry about, I get it. Take care of you. It's that time of year. The legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robinson handles our social media, and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. We're the Beatles. I see. I've often said that. I, I've, I've heard you say it. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2021. All rights reserved.